Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. Today we're going to begin a new topic, and that is parenting on the change grid. Now I'm going to start off with a very uh, important disclosure, and that is I don't have any kids. I've never had any kids. Don't know that I want to even borrow one. So <laughs> we always figured that if it was meant to be, <laughs> it was meant to be. But Linda has never felt a moment of maternal drive, and I have never felt a moment of paternal drive. And so um, we're all very happy the way we are. That being said, um, I've always thought that all a child really is, is a miniature adult. And so, um, and first and foremost, they're a human being. So to me, kids all have their own change grid. And while the scales on the change grid may expand as they get older and older, they still have a full range of responses available to them on whatever their change grid happens to be. And so that means that if we want to uh, better understand their behavior, predict their behavior, we just got to apply the change grid. And if we want to better develop them, then we need to apply everything we know about tension management and what's going on in different places around the change grid. So that is my, my uh, little disclaimer going into it. I cannot speak from personal experience. I certainly have had my share of nephews and nieces and other people's kids uh, and all that, but you know that's nowhere near what a uh, full day every day rearing is all about. So that is my disclaimer. Um, so uh, anyone else want to throw in a disclaimer? <laughs> Go like we got. No, T, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll step in for you when you need. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, to kind of play with that just a little bit, I thought I'd ask you guys a few little orientation questions um, and see if there's any consistency in your responses or patterns in your responses. And so when a child is first born, assume the child is, uh, you know, a typical birth, um, where do they enter the, the world? Where are, where are they on the change grid when they enter the world? Upgrid. Upgrid. <laughs> upgrid. How far upgrid would you think they are? Pretty far upgrid. Yeah. Why would that be? Why would that be? Why would they be upgrid? Because they're, they're everything has change. changed so dramatically. Everything's changed dramatically. They've had yeah. no experience with anything. No mm -hmm. experience with anything. Other than other than a womb with no view. Right, a womb, a womb, a womb <laughs> you. You are the master of all things pun. That's great. I, I uh, love it. It's a curse. It's a, well, it's a curse and a blessing. It's a blessed curse. <laughs> there you go. Plus, there's a whole new, based on just what uh, Shags and Dave was talking about, um, there's a whole new point of orientation that they're trying to grasp with. So, you know, that whole skin to touch and all those things represent Light. something for them. Right, right. Well, you figure they've never been hunger. touched before. Feelings mm -hmm. of hunger. Feelings right. of maybe hunger right then and there. And without getting over your first shit solution against your butt cheeks. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, the experience of birth for the mother, we already know what kind of, of uh, pain is involved with that and on and on and on. I can't imagine it's a painless experience for the baby. God, that's another thing too. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it's like I, I know guys have been kicked in the nuts, and I know women have given birth, but I don't know any guy who's ever said a few years later, I think I want to get kicked in the nuts. Right? Again. Yeah. You know, no, no, that's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I imagine we've all had that experience. It is very odd. Um, yes. All right. So I just got to say, you know. I don't know the babies, they don't always cry. I know often they have to do things to stimulate the baby to, to mm -hmm. take that first deep breath and uh, you know get those lungs working. But I have to believe that the, the trauma that the mother is experiencing is equaled by the trauma that the baby is experiencing. I don't yes. know. I mean, yeah. for all I know, cramps are a very different thing than feeling your entire body being you know ejected. So uh, anyway, I'm just going like, that has to be an upgrade experience right then and there. It's like you were just floating around in your perfectly warm little place. And all of a sudden, all this stuff starts happening and it happens all rather quickly. I'm not in the least surprised that that ends up being a very upgrade experience. Mm -hmm. Perceived challenge. I mean, it's surrounded by the unknown. Survival instincts are being triggered uh, in, that, in that entire process. So perceived ability. None. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, we end up then with this rather dramatic stress response. Now that stress response passes hopefully rather quickly within a matter of minutes. I like to know that the crying has stopped and uh, the baby is back in a warm sort of place and no one is tossing it around and all those kinds of things that are happening. Uh, Hopefully it's had some bonding time with the mother by that point in time, maybe even the dad, depending on the choices the couple made. So all of that has to now be the, the, the infant equivalent of downgrade maneuvers. Mm-hmm. So let's think about the downgrade maneuvers and tell me if you see that there is a, 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 a parallel uh, to what we already know about the change grid. So I uh, normalize it. Mm-hmm. I don't really know that the, the baby has anything to compare it to other than the womb that it was just in. And so soft, reassuring voice T there, there, there. Right. Because they're used to hearing muffled voices. I'm sure there's Mm -hmm. auditory. That's that's why they swaddle. Right. They swaddle swaddle them to keep them bound up. Yeah. Plus, you know, I've been in the delivery room before when I was working at uh, different hospitals, Detroit receiving, et cetera. And I can tell you that while they do keep that room warm, they do not keep that room at 98.6 degrees. No. this kid is being moved into a dramatic temperature shift um, mm-hmm. rather rather quickly. Um, so uh, anyway, but now you talk about, well, what happens afterwards? They get the kid cleaned up. The baby, I don't think, cares. Um, they get it nice and warm. They put it uh, close to its mother. Um, there's gentle sounds going on. Don't know how quickly a newborn wants to eat. Brian, you would know. Well, Kathy, you're a mom. You probably know. So. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a mom. Oh, you aren't? I thought you were a mom. I thought we chatted about No, that. I'm not a mom. But what I do is I cuddle neonatal preemies. Oh, that's it. Okay, yeah. And uh, I've done that for 30 years. So I'm very familiar with the transition process. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. What else What else would keep the baby upgraded in such an experience at that point? Well, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think you, you've named it all um Mm -hmm. i mean i think that the other thing is when they come in ill you know when they when they come in with deformities Mm -hmm. they come in with difficulties breathing their heart i mean all kinds of things can happen the same way that can happen with people so there's the transition of going from uh, of spending time in a nicu um spending time spending time in an in an incubator um um and the hardest thing for a baby in that transition is to be left alone. For example, I was with a baby uh, for three hours uh, Wednesday morning um, who was in an incubator who was probably about uh, three weeks out of the womb, but still highly premature. And uh, they're very, very lonely in there. You know, they're, they're, uh, and, and they need the contact. And since COVID, they haven't allowed me to cuddle as many incubator babies. They're more the ones that are already out there in their little cribs, but still being hooked up to various tubes and and, and things. But so this little baby, um, you know, really needed the connection and all of that. So what you're dealing with is, is just simply the the human connection, um, and you can't be skin to skin during COVID era. So so you're you know there's there's a whole range of of transitions that enables that baby to somehow go from you know to an incubator which keeps you nice and warm to then to the outside world where I'm holding it next to my body and trying to keep it warm. Um, uh but and and then it, introducing it to noises to sounds to you know whatever it is and then putting it back in and then having it basically be alone again so there's a there's a lot going on uh for um for preemie babies that's a whole different world you know right. than a baby that is then brought home and, and is able right. to a, a day or two yeah. yeah yeah that was me four pounds four ounces okay yeah. well I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. And and think about that. I, I tend to think that their down grip maneuvers are rather natural. Right. So, you know, like what Kathy was just describing, the holding, they have a natural wanting to connect. Like they don't, that doesn't have to be forced. No, that's an instinct, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, remember when we're talking about down grip maneuvers, that's why I think this is an interesting conversation to have. 
The four downgrade maneuvers or the four any direction maneuvers you want to look at are all um, conversational in their nature. So, you know, we're talking about normalizing and talking about ways to simplify it and restoring resources and adding resources. This tends to be something that we're trying to help the person to um, tap into themselves. But remember when you guys learned about the different maneuvers, the first thing that we do when we're teaching maneuvers is say, okay, so everyone imagine this. You're in a situation where you're feeling completely and totally out of control. Everything is just wildly, wildly chaotic, feeling very threatening, and you don't feel like you can do anything about it. What kinds of things do we do when we encounter a friend, a coworker, or a family member who's in some sort of distress in order to get them calmed down? And go ahead, everyone, you can rattle off some things that don't fall into the downgrade maneuvers, but nevertheless, we know would lower someone's level of tension. So, you know, patting them on the back, giving them a little hug, um, mm -hmm. just uh, giving them some sitting them down, giving them a drink. There it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Drinks, administering drugs and alcohol certainly work. Um, but, um, you know, to Kathy's point, this idea about cuddling, holding something <sighs> close, keeping them warm. So sometimes when we've got a friend, a family member who's out of distress, they might need to be held. They're just hugged. They might just need to know that you are physically there uh, to support them in any way that you can. And maybe you're giving them something to eat or drink, or whatever the case may be. So there are a great many things that we could do that would lower someone's level of tension. Unfortunately, the vast majority of them would be um, inappropriate, perhaps even illegal in a business setting. And so in a business setting, I can't go and hug somebody. I would be reluctant to it even if they granted me permission to do so. So I can't really do anything that I would do if it was a personal relationship. Um, I suppose I could administer them some food or whatever the case may be, but in the long run, that's not going to uh, help them apply their logic to get out of the um, emotional state they happen to be in. So it all ends up reducing itself to, well, you can normalize, simplify, add resources and restore resources. That's what you can do. But with a kid, a newborn, we're talking about try to create an environment that is as similar to the one they just left as possible. Isn't that what that whole idea about underwater birthing or when they're, when they're sitting in the pool of water? Is that still done or was that a fad that kind of fell by the wayside? No, they still do it. A lot of countries still practice that yeah, because the midwives are more um, a central component than the actual OBGYN in a lot of uh, other countries outside the U.S. U.S. system doesn't um, support that necessarily. It's still done, but not as prevalent as in other countries. Right, right, right. Well, we're big fans of called the midwife. And... Um, so I think that's England in the, we're probably up to like 1950s. I think that's where they are in their timeline. And certainly you can tell that the midwives are definitely doing the majority of the work involved with prenatal mm -hmm. and uh, delivery and all that sort of stuff. And then they pull in a physician only if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, that seems to be um, something that's many, I mean, some of us might have been delivered by a midwife. I mean, people in our age range might have been delivered by a midwife or a doula or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, okay, <clears throat> so um, yeah, so all these things are done to lower the kid's level of productive tension. We've taken care of new birth. Now let's go to the end of life. At the end of life, um, where do you think you where on the change grid would you like to be when end of life occurs for you? We'll do it that way. Hmm. Where would you like to be on the change grid when you're, when you're? I would like to be within the green circle or at the PowerPoint. Oh, do tell, do tell. Well, I, I, you know, if, I mean, are, I'm talking about right before. You yeah, know. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I'd want to be, I would want to feel the engagement of, of life and the joy of it, but also the ability to um, to detach in such a way that the that the ch that the shift will be less jarring. You mm -hmm, know, if mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. if it if it happens to be physically difficult, um, 
that the that the shift is like less jarring but to be able to be at that in that place of of awareness and right. and um you know i for me it would probably want to be at the on the on the i don't know the outgrid in the outgrid space maybe um and in, or at the powerpoint mm -hmm. that's very interesting yeah um and I think in a lot of ways, what you've just described is what hospice care facilities are trying to create for someone. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's great that we've got people that can be there, hold hands, talk gently with somebody, but to just be in as close to a Zen environment as possible would certainly help you to find the Zen in the experience that end of life probably offers. Um, I mean, I, I would, like that. Yeah. I like that idea. There was some interesting research about, you know, people certainly don't want to die with regrets, and that's quite impactful. But the research showed that living with regrets is even uh, more impactful. Right. And right, so right. I like that idea, what Kathy was just describing, because even if you're, you know, for someone to hear, you know, words like cancer could be a almost they take on like a death sentence because you're dealing with just what we described with the infant, right? The uncertainties, the unknown and what's going to happen, these kinds of things. So to be in that space, I think helps. And there's a lot of research about the symbiotic relationship between your beliefs and the quality of life at the end of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, tell me a little bit about where on the change grid you personally would like to be. So Kathy's chosen the center of the change grid. So this, because uh, I'm kind of wondering, Brian, if you're going to choose a spot on the change grid that resonates with what you've just said. So where would you like want to be on the change grid? I would, I would say somewhere in that green circle, just because if, if you know, if, if, you're too far downgrade, and we talk about that untapped potential. You don't want, I, I, I would not want to be in that space where, you know, I, I got it all figured out necessarily. I want to be in a space where I'm open to new modalities and those kinds of things. I wouldn't even want my physician to be down there because mm -hmm. then they're just going to do just the conventional thing. They're not going to be open to other discoveries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if they're too far downgrade, like this is how we know to treat it, that's fine. But are there options? Are there other options? Are there things that you have not considered? Mm -hmm. And so um, are you still trying to save the patient? Not save them, but when, when, when they move into what's called quality of life considerations, you're, you're asking the patient what's going to provide you with the quality of life that you want, given this so-called death sentence. Right, this, right, right, right. Right, and so that for me, that's not going to be down grid. That's going to be nope. more in that, that green area there because you, you have to arrive at a sense of peace with whatever is going on particularly if it's an adjustment to illness kind of a situation. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, this is the hand of cards you've been dealt. And this is, you know, whatever time you have remaining, how do you choose to, to spend it? And that's what I, I like. The, the research showed a lot of people have difficulty with that. Like healthcare is built on what they call dailies and qualies. An mm -hmm. insurance company use this. So dailies are disability adjusted life years. And qualies are quality adjusted life years. Ah. And so most of the sickness model that's out there is based on this idea of disability adjusted life years. So if you have chronic conditions, you know, the obesity, uh, the, uh, diabetes, all these lifestyle conditions, then you're going to have a higher daily than qualy. Mm. And so your insurance rates will be higher. And so, you, you know, and I think it's 83% of uh, Americans are metabolically um, uh, uh, disabled, like they're metabolic, they're, they're set up for pre-diabetes and those kinds of things. So already yeah. the quality of life issues are already, you know, at a, almost at a breaking point for many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, uh, Shags? David, where would where do you think you'd like to be? I like being in the center, but occasionally I will drift to uh, a little bit to the south, 
just out of complacency. Right. Mm -hmm. and, at the, and when your life comes to an end, where, where would you like to leave planet Earth? From the center, or from somewhere else? Oh, it doesn't matter. I won't be here to really discuss it. <laughs> well, I was gonna say that. <laughs> well, yeah. So you know, my, say uh, my, when I'm dead, I'm donating my body to a body farm so that animals and critters can drag it around and insects. Oh, and, there you go. You, you know, <laughs> so I really, honestly, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, I'll give you. I'll. Uh, I'll give you guys. Most, most likely, I'll be very out grid screaming. Ah! Well, uh, now that would be upgrade if you feel like you have no control over it. Upgrade, so yeah. That'd be upgrade. Now, outgrade is also interesting because that would be you want a, a life and you want death to come to you in battle. This is the Klingon mindset. Ooh, I would no, hear so I want to come very quickly at night. <laughs> right. And so people who just want to slip away in their sleep are the ones that are very far downgrade. Mm. You know, and uh, the, the people uh, who nobody ever heard from again are very far in grid. Right. They just disappeared because we really they disappeared while they were here. <laughs> so so would really that mean that. that a center is like where people die naturally from like just natural uh, I, actually, ages I, causes I think or is that, that down? The, no, I think the majority of people who are just routinely dying each and every day are probably. Well, how about this? With any mercy in my heart, I hope they're very far down grid. I hope they slip away in their sleep. Ah, so, gotcha. You know, that that would be it. No one needs to have the final moment of your life be the discomfort of a heart attack. Yeah. Or, the, yeah. or right, or the confusion of a stroke uh, or, you know, something like that. It's like, you know, if I got to go and I can't go from my, my place where, and I'm going to use some other words in just a second, if I could leave the planet in the center, well, wouldn't that be wonderful? Cause that's going to feel a, very different than if I just slip away. But if I have to choose between an upgrade, an outgrid, a downgrid, or an ingrid final moment, I'd like it to be a downgrid one. <laughs> so if those are my choices. Now, it's interesting going back to the center of the change grid, because a lot of things that Kathy said early on resonate with a great many things that um, we may have read or seen presented in a movie or a television series, probably more on the sci-fi side of things. But people use other words for this experience. They kind of believe that that some of them, uh, storylines I could share with you, would be ones where they believe that uh, the human body is nothing more than a form of transportation and the actual you is an energy form. And we might call that the soul. Others, you know, depending on which what you're reading or watching, are going to have other names for it. But basically, the thought is is that you continue to exist in a different state after uh, your use for this physical body is over and done with. And you hear a lot of that even in in traditional religious framing around death. You know that they've they've gone on. They've uh, they've been released. You know uh, where some of the uh, sci-fi things would say they've ascended to whatever the next level happens to be, or they've evolved into whatever it is. They've shed their worldly body. You mm -hmm. know, we, we hear these things all the time. Those kinds of descriptions all resonate with what I think happens in the center of the change grid, because I don't think if we can get metaphysical about it for a moment, I don't really think that's where you die as much as you transform into some other state. Where if you're really far upgrade, outgrade, downgrade, or ingrid, I think you died. I think you died. That's so, why I like that circle, though, because, you know, when I look at what I'm specifically interested in in coming to the States with this idea of longevity. So, you know, I'm only 52, but I look at these ideas of, especially, you know, from being a, a preemie. So when you're a preemie baby, you have that you tend to have developmental issues. Mm -hmm. So some things can develop later, like I had heart surgery at 18 mm -hmm. because they found a pericardial cyst on the heart Good. that typically grows at birth and you see it and then you remove it. But in my case, it didn't grow until like I was a teenager. Yeah. Then, you know, I'm dealing with autoimmune issues. So I look at how 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 can they age gracefully? Uh, because there's nothing scientific that I've seen that said just because we get older, you know, that we have to be resigned to the couch and we can't get up and those kinds. Right. So taking care of the body, to me, is in that space and, and, and facilitating quality of life is in that space. 
to me, like in that that green circle somewhere. Because again, if I'm I'm from too too far down grid, then there's no room for 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 growth because then I I kind of got it, and then I'm just gonna go from one fad to the next fad. And so I tried to be at a space where I can be open to, okay, yeah, I have these issues and I'm dealing with them. Yep. And I find different ways of dealing with them. And so I kind of move a little bit out grid in my development and understanding of these things in, in terms of longevity and that kind of thing. Cause it's like stem cell research. There's all different kinds of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, that movie, what was it cocoon where people are looking oh, yeah. for the, the fountain kind of stuff yeah that kind of stuff i'm not it. into but i'm into more like what what can i do that's more or less natural because like for the autoimmune conditions when i went to the rheumatologist they want to prescribe methotrexate that's their oh. way of dealing with it yeah, 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 yeah. methotrexate is a chemo class drug right, right. <laughs> so I'm like that's not gonna happen <laughs> yeah oh well, yeah that'll make me feel so much better really <laughs> so uh, yeah, very very interesting. Um, and again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, well, let me give you one one little illustration here. So you guys know I went to yoga um, anywhere between five and nine times a week up until COVID came along. And sadly, because of COVID, our local yoga school had to reduce its number of locations. It has several locations all around the valley, and uh, they ended up closing down our little one. Well, there was this gal who was at yoga almost every time I was there, and her name's Maud. Now, Maud was probably 95, 96 years old, um, and she would bear, be there at yoga. She'd be doing all the little movements. Yeah, she didn't have as much balance or flexibility or whatever. Range of motion was certainly different, but nevertheless, she was there, and she was doing her version of every single uh, um, pose we were doing. Um, now, not only did she go to yoga, she rode a bicycle to yoga from her house every single day. So imagine that here she is, this elderly, quite frail in many ways, she couldn't have weighed a hundred pounds. Um, and there she is staying vibrant and alive. Sadly, uh, COVID got to her, but nevertheless, um, it took something as severe as COVID to stop her in her tracks. Well, why is that? Was it more about her genetics? Was it more about how uh, she was treating her body or caring for her body? Um, I'll tell you that most of us in the, in the um, yoga school thought that it was because of where she always kept her, her frame of life, what, how she basically interacted with everyone and everything around her on a daily basis. Nothing was negative, nothing was a problem mm -hmm. for her. So, I mean, I would drive past her on the way and she'd be on her bike and I'd say, you know, Maude, it's a hundred degrees. Do you want to put your bike in the back seat and I'll uh, and ride over with me? She goes, no, 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 no. Thanks, no. And so I was like, oh my gosh, wow. I just want to like lose it on a bicycle. So I think you're absolutely right that a lot of it has to do with uh, longevity, has to do with quality. So, all right, now I think we've kind of gotten away from our, uh, our parenting kind of thing though. So we got to take another look at the kids. So I wanted to put end of life there just so I could say that we all tend to enter the world kicking and screaming, very far up grid. And if we're lucky, when our time comes, we'll be very far down grid. But if we are really practicing what we're talking about when it comes to the oracle of self and um, uh, finding your center of the change grid and working to develop your, uh, your comfort and your uh, kind of practical application of what can happen in the center of the change grid. I don't see any reason at all why we can't ascend. Why can't we evolve to whatever the next level is? Why do we have to frame what happens to us at end of life as dying? So mm -hmm. that to me is the, what the center of the change grid is really, really all about. I'm wondering if like when, you know, talking about the, 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 the birth, uh, you know, to end of life, like the kids come in and they naturally move beyond that PowerPoint and then the institutions, culture, family, all these things inculcate them with different ideas. And mm -hmm. so now they're moved all about. And, you right. know, perhaps that end of life journey is this, return trip where they're trying to figure things out because like i just seen some research about 
Gen Z, I'm not even sure if I understand who Gen Z is, but said they're the loneliest uh, uh, demographic. Hmm. They're more lonely than millennials and uh, my generation. What do they attribute that to? They attribute it to the fact that they came in, uh, you know, so I, I think the oldest millennial is like 40 years old. And so you know, they, they were born into this technology. And so everything's like one degree further in terms of disconnecting, right. you know, from people, from uh, reality, from, you know, self-permission, critical thinking, all these kinds of, everything is outsourced for them. Mm. It's outsourced to an algorithm, it's outsourced to technology. So this capacity to really be able to stand on their own two feet. I call it this self-permission. They, they, it basically don't exist for them, at least is what the research is showing. So they're the loneliest, but yet oh. they're the ones who can grasp technology and have a gazillion friends on Facebook, but they're the loneliest. Really good, very good. Okay, uh, anyone want to weigh in on anything else as far as this thought about where we enter and where we leave the change grid? Um, Someone said maybe we enter the world outgrid. I just don't know. In order to be outgrid, there has to be a high perceived level of ability. Um, I don't really know that I could describe. I don't know. It's a tough one. Does the baby have the ability to meet the challenge that is in front of it at the moment of birth? Not by itself. No. Not by itself. I don't know. David, a lot of babies got born. Long, long, long ago, with nobody doing much of anything. So, you know, I, 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 I have to. Yeah. yeah, I, I have to say, when I hear a baby cry, I can almost tell because I'm very auditory if it's if it's joyous or if it's painful. But let me tell you one other thing. J. L. Moreno, the father of psychodrama, and I bring him up a lot because he so was so brilliant, but. He said that, was it half of a person's mental health is decided at the moment of birth and it's how they perceive the challenge of breaking free. And I, God, he's so right on, on everything I, I know. And I, I think we have to give that some thought that, you know, getting out, is, is it a victory or are we a victim? And mm. I just think of patients who have said, you know, my child came into this world with a chip on their shoulders. And it's true that there's just that negative perspective in, in some kids at a very, very early age and others just, you know, are raising money or selling lemonade to help people in Ukraine at four years old. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. And, but he said it, half of mental health is determined by on an unconscious level, our perception of being victim or victorious. And I, I think he's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds very, yeah, interesting, very interesting. Um, okay, so uh, parenting begins with parent. So let's take a little look now at where should the parent be on the change grid? So if you wanted to be whatever you think the ideal parenting uh, style would be where in the change grid would that style tend to reside so, first child t you i think we need to distinguish between first and second and third and other children okay first, first child is upgrade yeah parents are going to be upgrade why yeah. would that be it's new experience and you yeah no ability yeah, yeah perceived challenge is high out. perceived ability is low mm -hmm. they're up in yep. stress probably. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. In fact, I often say the 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 my my daughter is the one that was teaching me, right? So right, you know, right. she's well, teaching me what the needs are and all those different kinds of things. So not no parenting book, none of that stuff worked. Period. Yep. <laughs> so there you go. Okay. Um, now, David, you were saying it depends on how many kids have you had. So let's say you're on your second kid. Where were you? A little further down grid, but still up grid. Mm hmm. Yep. 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 And uh, you've had how many now total? How many five. Boys you have? You've got five boys. Yep. And wow. uh, where where are you? Where were you on with number five? Well, uh, I was upgrade primarily because of the rest of the children. I mean, there was so much work to do and here comes a new one. Um, but I was in terms of worry or concern or anything like that. I was much more downgrade mm -hmm. because by then, 
How old was your what? How old was your first? Eight. Fifth was born. Eight when the youngest was born. Right. So you'd yeah, you'd already learned. Uh, yeah. Right. You'd, you'd been around the around the block four times. So uh, all right, and so um, so that that kind of makes sense as far as people getting accustomed to uh, to parenting or what parenting overall represents. Where on the change grid would you say a parent can parent most effectively? Where on the grid resonates with good parenting? Upper power. Upper power. Okay, so we mm -hmm. got to be. Let me squiggle over here. We want to be on this above the heart line. Mm -hmm. uh, but still in power. Why above the heart line? Uh, you want to be engaged. Okay. Uh -huh. And so if we go to the engagement rings, I just started to start to start a new deck. The other one, it was all, almost 300 slides long. It's too difficult to find what I wanted. So, uh, so you, you, the upper half of power, there's a lot there about engagement. Good. good, yep. good. yep. All right. Other thoughts, other cases, other possibilities? All right, let's approach it from the opposite angle. Um, I'm just going to go to the You guys really should be able to look at a composite and see whatever we're isolating without having to see the independent layers. But nevertheless, um, so mm, why not power stress? Why not stress? Why upper power? So what starts happening as your level of tension goes up as the parent? Well, you lose control. So, yeah, you lose control or you really perceive mm -hmm. yourself as having lost control. And so that's when the downgrid maneuvers would work in a conversational setting. Let's normalize this, simplify it, restore resources, add resources. That's what you would need. But you're right. What does parenting up in stress look like? If you had a parent who was always <laughs> up in stress. Mm. I had a parent in stress. Yeah, you turned out OK. <laughs> well is is that where the helicopter and more mothers and stuff like that come in you know that are yeah you know, or is that very far out grid very far out grid because most yeah. helicopter parents i've known perceive themselves as knowing what they're talking about forwards backwards and inside out right. right so they believe it is very challenging and they believe that they and only they are the ones that can do it but they have to watch the kid because again they perceive the kid as being surrounded by that which must be helicoptered so some threat of some sort or another or um i want to say trying to make sure your kid follows through and does what you want them to do i go back to was it someone being a stage mom was that what was going on in some of the movies we've all watched about uh, mm -hmm. hollywood and all that so are uh, the uh, you know you're going to be a great cheerleader because I wanted to be one. <laughs> you know? So the upgrade parents would be the one that's so stressed out. They're just like, just go do it, like whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. And remember what emotions live up here. So let's you know what, what emotions live this far upgrade. Anger, grief, fear, and shame. shame. Anger, grief, fear, and shame. Which one do you think the parent? Uh, would be most likely to display anger and anger. yeah yeah and so if this is a, and we know that I mean you don't know this when you're the kid but if you've gone through change work you know the reason why they're angry is because they're in a situation where they perceive themselves as having very little ability to handle whatever the challenge is before them that's why they're angry mm -hmm. so that's really interesting when you, you know, the, the, the kids all upset. Let's say you've got a toddler who's just screaming their head off. One of the things that I actually observed on the uh, on the airplane on the flight home was the parent yelling at the kid like mm. that's going to stop the kid from, from having an upgrade reaction. It's kind of like you should probably do a downgrade maneuver because doing an upgrade maneuver with an upgrade person just moves a more upgrade. I'm used yeah, to say we that. just gave you that red stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Floral hydrate. Yeah, sadly yeah. that comes in liquid form and they wouldn't let me bring it on the plane. So uh yeah, what can you do? Or the parent that's um you know trying to get the child to be still. And I'm like, the, the children have energy. What do you how are they gonna be still? Well, like, particularly what you... like okay, this gal was sitting behind me on the plane, and this kid was doing just fine for the majority of the flight. I mean, they were a toddler, so occasionally I get the back of my seat bumped or kicked or whatever, and they'd be fussy a little bit. Well, I live in a real world and I know I'm on a bus. 
And so I have to accept a certain amount of that behavior because that just goes with being a traveler. Um, but when we were coming in for a landing, the kid wouldn't sit down and wear their seatbelt. Mm -hmm. So they were being very fussy about the whole thing, very upgrade about the whole thing. And the mom's strategy was to hold the kid on her lap with her arms tightly wrapped around the kid, mm -hmm. kind of restraining this child. And that means the child screamed bloody murder nonstop for the last 10 minutes of the flight. Yeah. Had her arms wrapped closely around his mouth. Well, or, or it's kind of like, or it's like, what signal are you not picking up here? Okay, the flight attendants are, are seated. Put your kid in the seat and put your hand over the kid to be their seat belt, uh, if that's what you need to do. But come on. Anyway, um, yeah. obviously it moved me up grid. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and that's but, but T, <laughs> you're my therapist. Yeah. But T, don't you think, I, I mean, when people are out of control internally with themselves and their emotions, they control other people. So I think a lot of these parents, because of their own anxiety, yes. are, so to speak, micromanaging their, their children and being restrictive. And um, it only leads to rebellion, actually. It certainly yeah. does. So, yeah. you know, we're talking about the, what's, what's true against all the examples we've given so far is that the child is upgrade and the parent responds with a high perceived level of challenge but could respond with varying degrees of perceived ability. Mm -hmm. Like you guys know, you can't tell anybody else how to, how to, how to raise their kid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's nothing. No, but people will that. try. Well, I understand that. And I would hope they're perceived at least as being helpful or their intention is to be helpful. But sometimes you just want to say, if your kid is so young, they can't tolerate being in an airplane seat. Maybe you need to factor that in next time you travel. Mm -hmm. So, but that would neither be the time nor the place nor my place to say such a thing. Anyway, but my point is, is that having a doing something that drives your kid further upgrade is not going to do anything to change their behavior unless and until the kid just runs out of energy. The kid's mm -hmm. just exhausted from doing it. And then how's everyone else around you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. You know, T, this is also very time sensitive. My kids and I often talk about this. I was a very laissez-faire parent. Yep. And I could afford to be in Green Bay, Wisconsin in 1970. Yep. But today I would be a very different parent. So when we're talking about where we would be, I find it very different since the internet and so forth sure. as what kind of parenting style is going to work. Right, because there are more yeah. threats. There are. Yeah, there yeah. just are. You need a lot and, more awareness, I think. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember exact details of growing up, but I know when I was a young kid, probably kindergarten age, I don't have much much memory uh, earlier than that. Um, for us to go walking outside on the sidewalk was like a big nothing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go walk on the sidewalk and you know, stay out of the street. We certainly heard those those kinds of things, but the thought that we couldn't be out and alone, or I was seven or eight years old and my mom would send me down to the corner store to buy whatever it is that she needed. And yeah, I could, we could pretty much see the store from our front porch, but nevertheless, a lot can happen in today's world between the front porch and that store. Yep. Um, my, my wife used to go to the store, get cigarettes and liquor for her grandfather <laughs> when, she, when she was a little girl. Yeah. Wow. Wow. He'd say, Putsy, he'd say, Putsy, go to the store and bring me my stuff back. Really and she'd did. go and the and the drugstore clerk would hand her the cigarettes and the alcohol and all that. And she'd just walk home with it. Right. In fact, we didn't even have to have money. The 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 shopkeeper would just write it down in the book under our little account or whatever right. it was. And you know, I don't I you know, I'm sure my parents popped in periodically to pay the pay the bill, but uh yeah, it was just a very different world. And so I think uh, Edie's point is right. It's, you know, you have to kind of think twice before you apply mm -hmm. uh, what was normal in yesteryear to the rearing of children today. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, no. But anyway, go, going on. I think it's interesting that Edie, you you mentioned your you labeled yourself as being a laissez-faire kind of a parent. Well, a laissez-faire parent was someone who would perceive themselves as having adequate or abundant ability, uh, because the challenge is simply no greater than you allow to you allow it to be. So you have a decision when it comes to kids doing whatever they're doing. Is that a problem? Is that not a problem? Or is the behavior even encouraged? So Mm. that's three very different perceptions of what's going on in the world around you. So Edie, you want to tell us a little bit more about what it would have been like to be raised by you? (laughs) You know what? And and it was how I was raised. Right. Um, They knew what the boundaries were. And as long, it was like flying a kite. As long as you're being responsible, I'm going to give you more rope and you can do whatever you want. And they never pushed it and neither did I. I had all the freedom in the world. There was no, yep, and it worked. And all of my siblings have turned out well, my kids have, but it was basically, and they didn't want to lose that freedom. Mm -hmm. They liked having it. Right. And so they did what was necessary to earn it or keep it. It was a mutual respect, you know, and, and the other thing I was just going to, I think I mentioned with this group with Richard Brandon, I had him in my book, Winnie, and his mother took him, um, I don't know, five miles from home or a couple miles from home when he was like five, six years old and said, find your way back. And so I'm concerned that this day and age, um, we can't do those things that build that kind of entrepreneurial spirit, that independence, that problem solving skills, you know what I mean? Yep, yep. And, and, and so that's, that's kind of scary too, that we can. And the other thing is I had control as a parent. There was no internet. There was nobody else influencing. I was the influence. And mm. now parents are just stripped of the amount and percentage of control they have over their kids because right. there's some yeah. Edie, Edie, what about television? Yeah, my dad, we were the last. We weren't the poorest people in town, but we were the last people to get a television because my dad's thought was the beginning of, and we saw what happened. Um, but uh, I had to go to the neighbors to watch, you know, my little Margie and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and your kids- But remember, it was I Love Lucy. Television- First of all, television, I, I, you know, I mean, I remember when Elvis Presley wiggled his hips and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Green Bay <laughs> was, yeah, in Algoma, Wisconsin. Nobody would watch that. That was just way too suggestive. It, so yeah, it had to be very wholesome family values because yeah. remember back in the early days of television, I television was almost completely run by the advertisers. Uh-huh. And so you were all, it was soap powder or it was, you know, some kind of household product or whatever the case may be. Those were the mm-hmm. early days. And they wanted to know that they had wholesomeness was what it was all about. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, so where is um, the overprotective parent? The over well, what would the overprotective parent perceive? Would they perceive a little or a lot of challenge? A lot of challenge. A lot of challenge, but little ability. Would they perceive themselves as having a little ability or a lot of ability? A little ability, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. In which Mm -hmm. case they would be up in stress. That could be productive, but it's coming out of a place of stress. But they could also be very far upward with a very high level of ability, and they could be overprotective because you are their clay to mold as they into whatever image they want. So you know how some um, some parents are so, so, so restrictive, not because they themselves are afraid, but because they have decided what you as a human will do, will be allowed to do, whatever it is. So this is the bully parent versus the reactive parent. That's how I would kind of frame it. Yeah, see, I had a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finally, well, there's you also know... cultural elements too. There's also <laughs> yeah, cultural. yeah. It's had a little bit of both from both sides, and so I think that that was the um, the 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 catalyst of all the resistance because I would butt heads when that kind of thing happens. I like to be free to discover and learn, and you know we could we didn't watch TV. We could not go outside. We had to read and read dictionaries and prove that we had command of the words. So it was that kind of 
um, almost a pretension that you you have to show, you know, that you're you're part of this family kind of thing. Yep, 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 yep. It well, was uh, and and certainly I think again culture has a lot to do with it. So yeah. um, for example, you know, without being overly stereotypical, we still know how how different cultures are presented on TV. Um, an Asian family puts, I'll ask you, a high or a low value on on education. Yes, very high. <laughs> very high, in Indy, very high. We've been watching Bob Hart's Abishola. Have you guys seen that show? No, well, anyway. what's it called again? Bob Hart's Abishola. Oh. And it's about this guy who owns a sock factory in Detroit, of all places. And he falls madly in love with a nurse from Detroit Receiving Hospital. And she's from Nigeria. And mm -hmm. she has a young son. And, uh, you know, the, the conversation at home has uh, is always focused on are you doing, did you do your homework? What grade did you get? It had better be an A. And so uh, there's just a very big cultural difference between watching Bob, who was born into a regular Detroit family, uh, and you know he wants the son to have some adventures because the, the the kid wants to dance. He's like a great great uh, street dance kind of a guy, and um, he wants goes well go do that go do that. And of course Abishola is like oh no 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 no, mm -hmm. there's no time for that. You yeah, here, you know, you need the education. So I think there is a lot that's cultural, but nevertheless, that to me is someone who's parenting from a place where they believe a test is the foot. The child will always push. The child will always try uh, to get what the child wants, and so boundaries have to be put in place and have to be very, very tightly um, um, controlled. And those things have an impact on a child's life. I'm sure Edie can talk to that because like I met a physician uh, from India and she came here, similar situation to mine when she was younger. And so she quit medicine, uh, clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. And she said she always envisioned herself being literally, she said, the 1% of India uh, culture who did not uh, go to medical school or go into engineering school. Those were the only two choices she had. Yep. literally and so now she's she's at her age at 44 she's now on this path of looking to free herself you know because then there's you know the cultural value of women and you know those kinds she's the eldest and so all these things impacted her life over the years that she's unlearning some of it now mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep all right, so um, we, we really are building a case all the way around for why there's problems parenting from particular locations on the change grid. Again, parenting begins with parent. So what about in-grid? First of all, uh, if you're like me, even putting yourself into the mindset of, a, of an in-grid danger zone person, um, I can't really relate to that, but I can come up with stories about people who would be there, what kind of parent would they be? Hmm. That's interesting. So they would probably be totally neglectful. Totally neglectful, tell us why. Well, because they're neglectful to themselves. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're in the Ingrid danger zone. Yeah, Ingrid danger zone, yeah. Yeah, not yeah. necessarily just plain Ingrid, but my guess would they would just be, this is, I mean, they would be neglectful. It's it's in denial that they have the child. Right, right, right. More. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but more oblivious to what's yeah. going on than deliberately um, ignoring the child. It's just like they don't have that. It's not in their mindset. Yeah, they don't have the capacity. Right. I think the word I was using long, long, long ago to describe what the world is for this very far in grid person. Notice the far in grid person has a full change grid available to them. So there's still stress, power, stress, power, power, and empathy for looking at the diagram. So I'm squiggling around here. They have a whole world there, but their world is very, very small. And I used to describe these people as being simple. And uh, simple, I think, was an unfair label, but there is an element of that simplicity uh, or simple mindedness. Ugh, I hate saying that because I don't think they're that way because they're that way necessarily. I think they're that way because they haven't been supported 
to move move out of that frame of self. Yeah. Anyway, you know, this, this is really interesting because I'm just thinking I, it wasn't the typical uh, childhood, but I loved it and yeah. we all did. But I got to tell you, my last brother, uh, who's there's 20 years between my sister and my youngest brother, so they never lived together. And um, my mom was in her 40s and they were just busy with the car dealership. And so they were, isn't this interesting? Mm -hmm. um, it was almost like the town took care of them. The lady next door, husband did the Great Lakes. She had plenty of time. So he would just go over there. And then, so when it takes a village, but, but he's, one of the, he's one of the finest human beings I know, not just because he's my brother. He turned out just fine. But my parents kind of, they were, you know, they were almost 50. <laughs> he just kind of appeared and, and, and it just worked. Now, I think that's where small towns and communities Absolutely can serve a purpose. Right. He could, yeah. yeah. And, but they loved him. I mean, we all loved each other. They just worked 18 hours a day. And so the older siblings kind of, I, I kind of, I wasn't good, but I did. And, and so I find it interesting. So then you go back to what really works, what creates that quality time, maybe that engagement, mm -hmm. the, the essence, the energy of just knowing. And uh, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I, so I, the, I mean, the Ingrid is, um, would the Ingrid parent be, uh, this dissociated disconnected uh how 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 would you but well, that's that? what i'm saying brian is interesting because they weren't ingrid i mean my dad was oh. totally a magnetic personality if they were were downgrid yeah they they oh, were engaged they were engaged mm -hmm. but they but time wise everybody else kind of so what would you call that what would well, that be they're here on the change where i'm squiggling right now they perceive themselves as a very high, a very high level of ability to do it themselves because wow. they had other kids, but their level of tension around doing it, let me jump over here, was getting down into power apathy, not apathy, they're your parents, we've described them as being loving and all that, but power apathy. So they were able to somehow or another structure um, a way to have you uh, raised and tended to and observed uh, that liberated them to do other things they needed to do by pulling in resources that were ready, willing, and able to support them. Mm. So, you know, that kind of seems, seems a little bit right. They're relaxed because they've done it before. Very they relaxed. Have support around them. You know, the other thing is we went, they danced about three times a week, polka, you know, that part of the country. Sure. And but we went with them. I, I yeah. don't think we ever had a babysitter. So, you know, the kids just got piled in the car and we'd fall asleep on the benches while they were dancing till one o'clock. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, we were always a part of everything. I mean, yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting. So, it's how, how, how would you describe then something like I remember huh. that story um, from homeless to Harvard. Have any of you ever seen that? No, what's uh -uh. that? Uh -uh. I her name is Liz. I forget her surname, but she's now a professor and is titled from homeless to Harvard because she lived on the streets. Her mom was a drug addict. And so now she's a, you know, she went from shelter to shelter and now she's a professor. But I remember seeing her speak and she was talking about how much, you know, her, her mom would, you know, try to provide for her, but she was a drug addict. So she would see her mom using the needle and all these things. And, um, you know, and she get help from shelters. And that's how she got into school. And then won a scholarship to Harvard and became a professor. And she was talking about how much she loved her mom. And a psychologist came to her afterwards and told her, you know, all that sounds great, but there's no possible way that you could, uh, uh, experience love at this um, uh, rate that you're you're conveying to the audience here mm. and the lady she told the lady well all due respect you weren't there right. she said I just assumed my mom gave me the best that she had I never oh. once doubted her love for me she right. just wasn't in a condition you know that that you know um, you know was a so-called normal condition but it provided for us 
But but you know, Brian, that goes when when I wrote Winning and I interviewed all these people. The bottom line was they overcame. They had struggles, right? And so so the helicopter mothers and fathers, I I call uh, overindulgent negligence, mm. and and they are depriving their child from an identity to say, "Dang, I've done it. I did it. You didn't do it. You didn't butter my bread. I picked up the knife." I did it. And that's where self-esteem, confidence, it's the foundation of everything. And she had that, she had that opportunity mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. overcome struggle and believe in herself. Yep. Yeah. So wow. what do you think though about someone who's that far of an in-grid parent? I think that they are poorly equipped for the job. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, even if we talk about teenage pregnancies, very often part of the challenge is that the mother is still a child mm -hmm. themselves. I mean, developmentally, they've got a very long way to go. And some of them might seem like they're neglecting the child when the truth is they're just not really, I want to say, mature enough to, um, to really get all that. So to me, that feels ingrid. They have a very low ability to do it but they don't perceive it as being much of a challenge. Maybe it's because grandma and grandpa has ste stepped up because it was a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a young pregnancy. So, uh, but that's it. So I kind of, I do kind of view these as being um, less participative, but there's no malice involved. So where would this be, T? I have a client right now, but I've had many where they were outright told you know, we didn't want you. You weren't supposed to be born. You were an accident. Yeah. And and that's what they grow up with. I've got someone yeah. right now. The mother just died. So where would that parent be on the grid? I mean, actively I saying, I mean, where does asshole live on the change grid? Yeah. Outgrid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Outgrid. Yeah. It's got to be an yeah. outgrid kind of a thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's just a a very poorly evolved bad person they shouldn't have yeah. kids but they end up with a kid and, oh i can imagine oh. those in in vitro that get the s <laughs> the energy right. their parents are argue about not being able to support a child yeah yeah yep yep, yep. yeah well wow. there's subjects we could get into all around that whole that whole thing maybe we will i always, I always wondered about that yeah it would be a conversation i would not want to record and post but, Do you have a change grid professional in parenting space or work with parents? Well, most definitely Edie would be the closest. Okay. To she just dropped off okay. the call, but, but uh, she would be, because she's written the books about it. I know that a great deal of the work that she does is with, um, with children and different okay. social agencies, things like that. Um, so I would, I would imagine it would be Edie. Um, okay. But it seemed so, like all that we discussed thus far in terms of parenting is, total uh tension management <laughs> well I, 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 I say it all the time i think life is tension management so yes. you just want to look at this but i want to start by looking at the parents so our time's up for today so we'll just pick up where we left off come next week but um we need to still figure out well where is good parenting if we say that all four of these extremes are problematic we didn't talk about too far downgrade but this is when the child child is being deliberately neglected um, so, uh, or, you know, uh, what, what's going on there and other things. I think the there. most interesting parents I ever knew were of good friends in high school. And one was a pediatrician and the other was a child psychologist. Oh, Ooh. interesting. So they were happy. They were healthy, both physically and mentally. Interesting. Yeah, and the kids were, uh, you know, given a lot of freedom and set boundaries and. Yep. 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 Okay, all right. Good talking to you guys. We will pick up where we left off. Bye.